Hello, everyone, and welcome to the University of Arizona's first virtual homecoming. I hope you're enjoying all the wonderful programs available to you from the comfort of your own home. On behalf of the University of Arizona, please join me in welcoming Justice Neil Gorsuch to our virtual homecoming. Justice Gorsuch, it is an honor to have the westernmost member of the current court for this outstanding conversation, and we are incredibly grateful to have you here. This conversation with Professor Ellen Bubbly is an incredible opportunity for our current students, alumni, and university community. As you may know, the University of Arizona has a strong connection to the Supreme Court justices from the West, notably reflected in the creation of the William H. Rehnquist Center on the Constitutional Structures of Government. Chief Justice Rehnquist taught a short class at the College of Law for years. Justice Gorsuch, please feel free to visit Tucson and the University of Arizona in person whenever it's convenient for you and safe to do so. It would be an incredible honor to host you, and I'm sure our law students would be thrilled to hear from you. Thank you again for being here today, and I hope you have a lively and productive conversation. Next to welcome Justice Gorsuch is our distinguished alumnus, State Supreme Court Chief Justice, Robert Brutinell. Hello, I'm Bob Brutinell, Chief Justice of the Arizona Supreme Court. On behalf of Arizona's trial and appellate court judges and on behalf of the alumni of the college of which I am a proud graduate, welcome to Arizona and to the University of Arizona College of Law to discuss your recent book. Among the important topics you raise in the book are the vanishing jury trial, both civil and criminal, along with civil justice reform to reduce the expense and delay of civil litigation and a topic well suited for a law school audience, the expense of a legal education. As you mentioned in the book, Arizona is a leader in such discovery reform. We share your belief in the wisdom of juries and the importance of jury trials. Sadly, our jury trial numbers are as abysmal as the national numbers you quote. And I particularly appreciate your championing the cause of access to affordable justice. We share your concern that the average citizen is not able to afford the help he or she needs to negotiate our complex legal system. This year, Arizona adopted new rules allowing licensed paraprofessionals to practice law in certain practice areas and we abolished rule 5.4 of the rules of professional conduct as you discuss in chapter five. I look forward to learning more about your ideas for system reform generally. The vast majority of judges are dedicated to following their oath and making decisions based on the rule of law, wherever the facts and the law take them and not based on their preferred outcome. As you put it, to apply the law's terms as faithfully as possible. Thanks once again for making that point. We appreciate your taking the time to be with us today. We are honored to have you virtually present in Arizona and at the College of Law, and we look forward to the time that you will be able to visit us in person. Thank you, Chief Justice Brutinell, and thank you, President Robbins. Welcome, Justice Gorsuch, to this digital conversation. We hope when circumstances and schedules allow, you can join us in person. It's a great opportunity for all of our students and the College of Law community to hear this conversation. And now, without further ado, Justice Neil Gorsuch and Professor Ellen Bublik. Hello, Ellie. Hello, it's great to see you. As Hello. you can see, everyone is so excited to have you here from the university level to our Law College alumni, to the Dean, um, and of course, I'm so glad that you could join us today for our homecoming. It's just a pleasure to have you. Well, I wish I could be there in person. And, and, and as I mentioned to you a little earlier, the setting behind you really is kind of making me homesick for, for Boulder. But uh, those introductions were very kind. And I'm, I'm going to take you up on the offer to come to Tucson one of these days. We will love that. And um, I just have to say, I know that you're going to find the Catalina Mountains uh, compelling, given your love for the outdoors. So I so appreciate that. And I know our students will love to get a chance to meet you in person. I'll look forward to that. And if in the meantime, they, you have a group of them out here in Washington, you let me know. I will do that. Thank you. Um, 
Let me start by just telling everyone a little bit about you and your background. Um, Justice Gorsuch was an honor student at Columbia University and then at Harvard Law School. He then went to clerk for the DC Circuit for Judge David Sentel, after which he clerked for the United States Supreme Court uh, for Justices Byron White and Anthony Kennedy. Um, from there, he went to the top litigation firm, Kellogg, Huber, and Hansen, where he became partner in just three years. And in his 15 years of litigation practice in Washington, DC, at the same time, he received his Doctor of Philosophy and Law from Oxford University. So you can see that justice was never an underachiever. Um, he then served as Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General at the US Department of Justice. And in 2006, he was appointed to the 10th Circuit where he served for over a decade before being elevated to the United States Supreme Court um, on my birthday. And actually, conveniently, here you are on my husband David's birthday. Um, it's oh, great... well, happy birthday to David, another Thank classmate you. of mine. Right. Um, now, the justice and I met when most of these achievements were just a glimmer in his eye, um, when we were one else in the same section. And uh, as you can oh, see, no. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, as you can see there. from this picture, um, it, our graduation was just a couple of years ago, um, but just as you look the same, except for uh, a little lightening of the, the hair. Yeah, not, not, yeah. I, I, you look the same, Elliot. That's, <laughs> I appreciate it's remarkable, it. actually. You're the only person who will say that. Remarkable. Um, when the justice was nominated for the Supreme Court, um, a newspaper reporter called me and asked, 25 years earlier, when you were in law school, would you have thought that Neil Gorsuch could become a Supreme Court justice? And my answer was just a straightforward yes. Um, in a class of amazing students, Justice Gorsuch was respected and admired, and perhaps equally important, he has always been principled, intellectually curious, a deep thinker, kind, and a stand-up person in every way. Our classmates who know the justice as a person, both Democrats and Republicans, hold him in high regard and have spoken out strongly in his favor. When we talk about judicial virtues like impartiality, independence, collegiality, and courage, Justice Gorsuch fits this description to a T. Um, there are many challenges for online education in this unusual year when the pandemic has forced us to meet online, but an incredible silver lining is the chance to have you join our Arizona law community today to discuss your best-selling book, A Republic, If You Can Keep It. Thanks to the chambers and the college staff who have made this meeting possible and to the many, many Arizona law students, alumni, faculty, and staff who have come today to listen to your views. Um, let me begin with a subject that's very important to the college and to our state, access to justice. As Chief Justice Brutnell mentioned, the Arizona Supreme Court has been a leader in access to justice reform, such as allowing alternative business structures and permitting limited forms of practice by non-lawyers. In addition, the University of Arizona James E. Rogers College of Law was the first US law school to offer a bachelor's degree in law, which has become a pipeline into the legal profession for first generation college students, women and students of color. And Justice, I wonder if you could tell us about your involvement in issues of access to justice and why this issue matters to you and to the courts. Well, let me start by uh, thanking you, Ellie, for those kind words. It's really lovely to be here. It really is lovely to be here with you. It always is. Um, and I wanna thank uh, the Chief Justice and the Arizona Supreme Court for being leaders in this area. Uh, I, I think 
the importance of these issues was impressed upon me, particularly as I first became a judge. And at that point in time, I began to see what happens when individuals are faced with a, a Byzantine litigation system. Uh, with rules of evidence written in eight point font that go on for hundreds of pages, where the immigration laws take volumes and the Internal Revenue Code more. And individuals, ordinary people are expected to be able to comply with, follow all of these procedures. And we have a tidal wave of pro se or self-represented persons entering our system. Those concerns uh, worried me. What worried me even more is the ones who were able to sometimes obtain legal representation and receive very poor quality work, frankly, from lawyers who may not be expert in those areas, understandably. And it, it, it occurred to me, the more I thought about it, that maybe we have to look at ourselves as a, as a profession um, for, for some of the responsibility for these sad circumstances. After all, we're a self-regulated profession. Nobody else gets that privilege to regulate their own profession. And when you study the rules as you have, and, and I did as I taught legal ethics and professionalism at, at Boulder for many years, one thing that quickly becomes clear is, is it's sometimes hard to, to defend those rules, many of them, as in the best interest of our clients as opposed to ourselves. And I think at any rate, we have to, we owe it to our clients to ask that question about things like rule 5.4 and the unauthorized practice of law provisions and ask who are these protecting? And why is it when complaints for unauthorized practice of law seem to always be filed by lawyers who are afraid of the competition rather than clients upset by the quality of the representation? Perhaps sometimes, your best representation isn't by a 1-800 lawyer, but by someone who may be a non-lawyer who's particularly expert in that area. Somebody who's been through the system of seeking social security disability benefits, a parent who's been through an idea of proceeding for a disabled child before. Perhaps that person is better than somebody who has no experience in that area, but who happens to have a JD. So those were some of the kinds of things, Ellie, that caused me to get interested in and start advocating and writing about these issues. Your own family has three generations of lawyers. What do you say to the lawyers who worry about these kinds of changes and their effects on legal practice and legal education? Well, I'd say, first of all, can you afford your own legal services? I can't. I couldn't afford my own hourly rate when I was a lawyer. And I sure as heck can't afford it now on, on a government salary. And if that's the case, you have to ask yourself if something's upside down here. And with legal education, you have to ask some similar questions. You know, why is it that, putting aside Arizona, Basically, legal education in America is a single commodity item. There's one postgraduate three-year JD program, and it looks pretty identical whether you uh, go to uh, school in Arizona, Colorado, Michigan, or Montana. That's kind of unusual. I mean, it's, it sort of reminds me of Henry Ford back when he had a monopoly in, in automobiles. You can have any color of car you want so long as it's black. Um, diversity of product, diversity of services tends to serve consumer welfare better than a monolithic structure. And so I sometimes wonder whether uh, we have to ask ourselves, are we serving our clients the way we should? Or are we just perpetuating the status quo that we've always been so comfortable and familiar with? And I think for lawyers, uh, you might want to welcome the opportunities that would come with uh, being able to bring into your firm uh, non-lawyer legal professionals who might be able to open a new line of business for you, um, who might be able to access consumers at a lower rate um, and still be profitable for your firm. 
in new business areas. Alternative business structures, which Arizona is experimenting with, uh, have been experimented with in England, and they've been enormously popular. And they've, they've really helped consu consumers, average middle-class consumers, receive access to justice in a way that they have not been able to before. It's a business opportunity, I could say to your, your lawyer friends, Ellie, if I had to. Absolutely. Not only is it the right thing to do, it may also be a good thing for them professionally. Yeah. And that focus on client opportunities really um, appeals to the highest and best in our legal calling, which is really to serve uh, the legal needs of the people. So I so appreciate your thoughts. I want to switch to um, questions of equity. Throughout the book, you repeatedly express concern for disfavored persons. Why is that concern important to you? And how do you think the legal system can ensure that it doesn't favor certain persons or classes of persons? Well, Ellie, I, I think maybe the most profound guarantee in all of our law is the guarantee of the equal protection of persons. Right? And that guarantee is chiseled above the front entrance to this building. It's embodied in our 14th Amendment. It took a civil war to win. And the notion that no one is better than me, no one is worse than me, no one's above the law, no one's below the law. It is an incredible idea in the history of law and the history of mankind. And one of the great privileges of being a judge uh, I don't have a client. I don't have to worry about billable hours. I just get to come in and make sure that the promises of the law are realized for everyone. And frankly, there are plenty of people who are capable of uh, ensuring that their rights will be vindicated in courts of law uh, and outside of the greatest thing that we do as judges is, is make, help make that promise of equal protection or equal treatment real for the people for whom that is not obviously going to happen. Um, the United States government comes in here as it did this week, as it does often, on equal footing with an undocumented alien seeking admission to this country. They're treated exactly the same. It doesn't happen in many places in the world. And it hasn't happened in many places in human history. And to be part of that, a small cog in that machine is what gets me up in the morning. It's an incredible opportunity. Um, and it's also an awesome responsibility. And I wonder, you know, you express in your book admiration for judges like Judge Waring in South Carolina, who you say stood firm against popular pressures in early civil rights cases that deeply challenged segregated society in his home state of South Carolina, and Justice Harlan's dissent in Plessy. But you also took, take note of some major mistakes the court has made, as with Justice Taney and Dred Scott, or Justice Black in Korematsu, how do you know in real time if you are making the right decision? Well, you don't, right? I mean, how do you know as a parent you're making the right decision? As a teacher, the right decision. As a friend, the right decision in hard circumstances. You don't. Um, the best you can do, I think, is to ask yourself what your motives are in reaching the decision you're, re you're reaching and always question them, right? Am I doing this for me? Am I doing this for my own preconceived notions or am I trying to do this according to the law as best I can, right? Putting all that other stuff aside as a good friend would, right? Am I, am I coming at it from my perspective or am I trying to take into account my friend's particular circumstances, his values, his needs, her particular circumstances? And I think a judge in the judicial process, it's the same thing. You put on that robe to remind us it isn't about us, right? 
we should be pretty anonymous in this process and that we're trying to make real the promises in the written law in the real world for real people on equal footing before us. And in terms of uh, Plessy and Dred Scott and Korematsu, you know, I think it's easy to look back and say who was right and who was wrong. And you'd hope you make the right decisions. And I think if you follow the judicial process, and if you really do try to follow the law, rather than worry about external political factors or external pressures, right? I, you know, and, and Dred Scott, I'm sure Chief Justice Taney thought his solution was uh, a way to help avoid a civil war. He invented a substantive due process right to own a slave in the territories that Congress couldn't regulate or uh, dismiss. That was really the first abandonment of the original meaning of the Constitution in a serious way by the Supreme Court of the United States and the creation of substantive due process doctrine. I, I don't doubt he did it thinking he was dealing with an important exigent problem. And I don't doubt Justice Black and Korematsu thought much the same. But if you can manage to put those things aside and look at the law dead on, you're gonna to come to the conclusion, you know, as Justice Harlan did in Plessy, in his sole dissent, right? That it's pretty hard to reconcile the idea of segregation with the equal protection of the laws or with Justice Jackson and Korematsu or with the dissent in Dred Scott. So it's hard. And there are no guarantees. And you, you'll be long gone before history makes any judgment. But that's true with all of us in our personal lives, in our family lives, in our professional lives. And it's nothing different here. Um, you, in your book, draw so much strength from the um, Constitution and the structure uh, particularly the separation of powers, the structure of the Constitution. Um, this is really critical to your views about what it is that you should be doing as a justice. Um, can you talk about why the separation of powers is so important to you? Well, I'm really glad to, to be able to do that because, you know, I think when, when we all approach the Constitution for the first time in law school, right, we're pretty enamored by the Bill of Rights. I mean, who can't like the Bill of Rights? I mean, I like to talk and I like to have my own religion or none at all. And I sure as heck like my privacy, all right? And I wanna confront my accuser. And as a, as a young lawyer, all those things sound super. Um, but I think what, what, what occurred to me as I became a judge again, is that what, what James Madison recognized and, and he taught us, you know, he wrote both the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You know, I, I meet a lot of young people today and I ask who wrote the Constitution and they tell me Thomas Jefferson. And, you know, they, they've watched too much of that Hamilton. I mean, I loved it. It's a great, great show. But, but okay. poor James Madison gets a really bad rap in it. And the fact of the matter is, you know, Thomas Jefferson was in France when they were writing the Constitution. And France is a lovely country. I got no, 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 no problems. But Matt Madison wrote the Constitution, and he wrote the Bill of Rights, and he, he opposed the need for the Bill of Rights. I mean, he, he wrote them and he did it, but he thought, and, and he told us, and, and I think it's really true that you can promise anything, and you can write down that we have certain rights and recognize them, and they're beautiful, and they recognize the innate value of each person, and, our, and, and they, in their own way, recognize our quality. But they're, they're only paper promises. And when you look around the world today, there are a lot of countries that have bills of rights that are at least as good as ours. And some are quite, I think, better. And my, my personal favorite these days is, is North Korea's. It's excellent. It, it promises everything that we have in our bill of rights, along with a whole bunch of other good things. My personal favorite is a right to relaxation which sounds really good right about now. But the fact of the matter is that the reason why those bills of rights around the world sometimes aren't worth the paper they're written on is because of a lack of a separation of powers, that all powers concentrated in too few hands. 
And what Madison recognized is if you get the structure right, then the promises of the Bill of Rights will follow whether you write them down or not. And if you get the structure wrong, then it doesn't matter what you wrote, right? They're not gonna be realized. So that, 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 that's, and I, I, can, I can give you some examples about how I saw that play out as a judge in life that made me really realize that the more important part of our constitution when you're learning it is a 1L or a 2L, isn't, isn't the Bill of Rights portion, it's the structural stuff. What do you say to people right now, you know, who doubt that that um, historic structure is going to uh, work, who doubt that, you know, the different branches are going to do the things that the different branches were designated to do in the Constitution? Well, well, let's just come up with some examples, right? What happens when uh, judges become legislators, right? When we take over that responsibility, nobody elected us. There's no recourse. You can't change our rulings, right? And when we when we enshrine them in the Constitution, so you have things like Dred Scott that happen, right? When there's no textual basis for what the court did there, there's no way to defend it. It's a piece of legislation by unelected individuals. And the dangers of that are obvious and intuitive to us. What happens when uh, the executive branch takes over the legislative function? Well, what's supposed to be a really hard process fought out by the people's representatives through compromise and debate in bicameralism and presentment to the president, that whole laborious process, which was designed to be slow and difficult, right? The Senate was a saucer that was gonna cool the House's passions, all that stuff we learned, right? Madison thought that the, the lawmaking power is the most dangerous power. It's the one that is most likely to invade our liberties, right? Congress sets what the government can do and what, how it can, what requirements can impose on your life. That's why he made it so hard. What happens when you move that to the executive branch and make it really easy? Well, the first thing that happens is you get a lot more law, a lot more impositions on the lives of individuals. You get a lot, a, a lot less opportunity to participate in it. There's no representatives that you're electing to participate in that. The president gets to do it. One person, you elect a king effectively for four years and the kings change. And so the laws change and you have to keep up. Or what happens if the king's not paying too much attention? And so really it's unelected bureaucrats who are making these decisions. who are responsive to nobody, not even the whole of the people, the way the king is at least, are temporary kings. And you know this can sound kind of wonky or academic until you start seeing it happen in the lives of real people. And that's what happened as a judge for me. That, that's what persuaded me and what I talk about a lot in the book. Because the big corporations or the wealthy individual, they, 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 can, they can game all this out. They know when the kings change. They can buy and sell some of the kings. But what happens to the immigrant? What happens to the small business person? What happens uh, to the individual who's subject to, to tax regulations, social security disability? benefit regulations, the veterans seeking his due. Those people can't keep up. Those people cannot follow all of this. And yet they're expected to. And they're the ones who get caught up in the mall. And I'll give you one example, just I can give you millions of these. Well, um, dozens and dozens of these that I saw as a judge, as a workaday judge in the trenches of the law in Denver for 11 years. And it persuaded me that this separation of is important. I'm not saying we go back to the horse and buggy days of the 1790. Nobody suggested that. But that maybe we should just at least think about some of these things. Here's my example. One example. Um, a small company called Caring Hearts provided home care services for the disabled and elderly and under the Medicare provisions, you know, contracted with Medicare. The government accuses them of fraud. And as you know, when you're accused of Medicare fraud and you're a Medicare provider, that's, that's it. That's a death sentence to your, to your company and your employees and everyone's gone and you're just out of the industry. For, I mean, that, 
There's no coming back from that. They fought, the, they fought the charge for a number of years. It went through all kinds of administrative proceedings, laborious administrative proceedings, through the courts, finally up to the 10th circuit. We're talking years, years. And finally, one of my law clerks comes to me and says, hey judge, you know, you know Medicare publishes a new book of regulations every year. I said, yeah, yeah. You know, there are about 37,000 new documents that they produce every year that Medicare providers like Caring Hearts have to follow. That's a lot of law. I said, yeah. I said, well, you know, I went and looked and it seems like the provisions that the government's saying that they violated didn't exist at the time they provided their services. And I said, I can't be, I mean, the government wouldn't, I mean, the government wouldn't, wouldn't do that to somebody and we wouldn't, wouldn't have gone on for all these years. Somebody would have figured that out. Nobody had, my law clerk did. And um, it turned out even the government was so confused by the amount of law it was creating at a bureaucratic level and forcing small businesses and individuals to comply with that even it was confused. So those are some of the consequences in the real world for people when our separation of powers gets mussed up. I actually, I want to bring another person from the Arizona law community into our sure. conversation here and um, go to a question from my former student, um, Arizona Court of Appeals Judge Maria Elena Cruz, who's been instrumental in a number of justice initiatives here in Arizona. My name is Maria Elena Cruz and I'm a judge on the Arizona Court of Appeals Division One. I'm also an alum of the University of Arizona, both undergrad and law school. It's a pleasure to have you join us here today. My question for you, Justice Gorsuch, is in Gutierrez Brizuela v. Lynch, a 2016 case out of the 10th Circuit, you wrote a concurrence where you referred to the doctrine of Chevron deference as permitting executive bureaucracies to swallow huge amounts of core judicial and legislative power and concentrate federal power in a way that seems more than a little difficult to square with the constitution of the framers design. Can you talk about how Chevron deference threatens our government's notion of separation of powers? Ellie, that's one of your former students. That is from uh, not even not even my first class, but a few years ago. I mean, aren't you? Isn't it just such a joy to see your former students go on to, to do such things and to, and to be such participants in our public life? I mean, it's 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 one of the great joys of my life, and I know it must be yours. I always say the only people I like as much as my current students are my former students. Right. Well, well uh, it's a great question from Judge Cruz and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Um, so first of all, what is Chevron deference, right? I mean, not everybody follows this stuff, but it's just simply a, a judge made doctrine that says when the law is ambiguous, then the tie goes to the government. Any reasonable explanation of the law that the government can come up with, we judges will defer to. And I have criticized that doctrine, and I stand by those criticisms. Um, the basic problem, in a nutshell for me, is that it's the judge's job to decide what the law is. I, I mean, I, I thought I'd read that somewhere, maybe Marbury versus Madison, your first year law students might have gotten that one out of Chief Justice Marshall, right? In our separation of powers that you're entitled to an independent interpretation of the law by a neutral arbitrator called an Article Three judge. Somebody who isn't answerable to a politician, unlike under uh, Chevron, where the, the tie goes to the, to the executive branch of the federal government, to the king. Um, I, thought, I thought no matter whether you're an immigrant or a businessman or a criminal defendant, that when it came to interpreting the law, you come to court, you have a trial, the jury decides the facts, the judge decides the law. And you're entitled to his or her best estimation of the law 
and we give that person life tenure to ensure that they are protected from political pressures and they, they can make their best independent judgment about the law's meaning. It can't be shaded or edged in anyone's favor. That's my basic problem with Chevron in a nutshell. Now, who does it really matter to? And I think this is what maybe Judge Cruz was getting at. The case that I wrote about it involved an illegal immigrant to this country who was seeking admission to this country. And the government changed its interpretation of the law over and over again and kept saying, well, we still get deference. We get deference. We get deference because it's ambiguous. And what I wrote there is, you know, that's an easy game to play if you're a Fortune 500 company. And the regulating part of the federal government is a, one of these glass revolving door places where you send in your lobbyists during your favorite president's term. You might even be able to buy the place effectively. We all know about public choice theory. And in any event, you can predict and control a lot of your behavior around changing administrations and what they're going to do in terms of shading ambiguous statutes to make sure you can deal with it. Who can't? And who can't do those things? It's the average person. It's Mr. Gutierrez. Um, and to me, the judicial oath that I am supposed to apply the law without respect to persons means that I owe Mr. Gutierrez my best independent judgment, and especially Mr. Gutierrez. You talk in a number of places about the importance of notice to litigants, to the people, about what the law is. Um, and I wonder, you know, you're talking about originalism and technicalism in part, not only, but in part um, having some of those uh, notice features. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about your views about um, original, originalism and textualism and, you know, maybe a little bit about some of the concerns that people have about originalism, that this does get us back to the horse and buggy days that, you know, aren't some of those cases like Plessy really a product of originalism and the like? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about that. So what, what is originalism? What is textualism? Um, let's, let's just start there. It's just simply the idea that a judge should try to apply the law according to the meaning that it had according to the public meaning, original public meaning it had when at the time it was enacted. And when you think about it, that's, that's pretty much how we interpret most, most, most texts, right? When, when uh, Shakespeare speaks of whether somebody will let him, you know, are, are you talking about permission or is he talking about um, um, let as in tennis where something gets missed? We have, to, we have to go figure out what it meant in that context of that time, that word. And that's how we interpret statutes and laws usually, right? You'd, you'd usually look to see what did this statute mean? In the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when it talks about discrimination on the basis of sex, what do those terms mean? So it's, it's a really the standard way of interpreting legal texts forever. Um, is it horse and buggy? It certainly has a bad name, right? I mean, it's bad, poor branding. Originalism is actually a, a tag that came up, somebody came up with who's opposed to the idea of originalism. So I, I'd say maybe we haven't been great in our marketing. The alternative is something called living constitutionalism. Well, now who wants a dead constitution? I, I don't want a dead constitution. That, that sounds bad, right? I don't want powdered wigs, despite my gray hair. You know, I want, an enduring constitution. I want your rights to be as solid today as they were the moment they were promised to the American people. And I want your children and your children's children to rest sure that they will be there for them too. That's what it's all about. Preserving the guarantees of the constitution and the laws of the United States for everyone. Um, so in terms of the horse and buggy days and that kind of stuff, I say that's not what we're talking about. Okay, take a look at like 
U.S. versus Carpenter, which had to do with cell phones and your, and your, and your privacy and your cell phones, all right? One can ask, uh, you know, is it a, a paper or a fact, the cell phone under the Fourth Amendment? Yes, it's, it's definitely a personal effect. It qualifies. Okay, well, then the rules of the Fourth Amendment that were embodied in law at the time of the original meeting generally require the government to get a warrant to search your cell phone, okay? And, and so very traditional and ancient principles can apply to modern circumstances. And in fact, if you take a look at our case in Carpenter, you'll see exactly where we're struggling with trying to be able to do that in ways that bring home our ancient constitutional rights to contemporary circumstances. And there's nothing new about judges doing that either. We always take old laws and apply them to new circumstances. That's just what we do, whether it's the Civil Rights Act of 1964, does it apply to LGBTQ persons or whether it's the Fourth Amendment, whether it applies to your cell phone. That, that is what judges do. They take legal texts and apply them to new circumstances as they arise. Let me ask you what happens when um, those interpretations um, that come out from an originalist context um, contradict with precedent to some extent. And actually here, let me introduce my very newest colleague, um, Professor Eunice Lee, who's a professor oh. of uh, immigration law and constitutional law. This is Gorsuch and thank you for joining us. I had the good fortune of meeting you at the Byron White Courthouse in 2006 and recall well your kindness to all of us Denver clerks. In reading your book, I was struck by your sense of obligation to history and future in your section on the art of judging and in your essay on precedent. Among other reasons for respecting precedent, you write, quote, a good judge recognizes that existing judicial precedents reflect the considered judgment of judges who have come before and sometimes embodied the settled expectations of those in our generation. But there can be tensions between stare decisis and the originalism and textualism you espouse in your book and other writing, stressing fidelity to the text of the Constitution and statutes as written. Can you remark on the role of stare decisis within an originalist and textualist jurisprudence? Are there circumstances where settled judicial understandings might stand even when an originalist or textualist reading would reach a different conclusion? Elia, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Well, first of all, it's, it's great to hear from Professor Lee. Um, boy, uh, that's just wonderful you have, have her there. Uh, I, I believe she clerked for uh, Judge Lucero, mm -hmm. um, a dear friend who was across the hall from me for many years. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to comment on that. Uh, so the basic idea is what happens when uh, you look at the Constitution, and you're pretty darn sure that it originally meant X, but we now have a precedent that says Y uh, or not X, which wins? And doesn't that, some, it's sometimes suggested, doesn't that disprove originalism or suggest that it's a problem? And I guess let me tackle that part first. Everybody has a theory on how to interpret the constitution, all right? Everybody or statutes. Originalism is one possibility. But this whole living constitutional thing, that turns out to break down into about a thousand different theories, right? We all, we've all got, we've all read them, right? You know, the, the latest hot theory of constitutional interpretation. And so whatever theory of constitutional interpretation you adopt, it's gonna sometimes run into an adverse precedent. You're gonna definitely have some point when no matter what theory you adopt as a judge, you're going to have to face the possibility that your theory and a precedent are in conflict. So I just say to you, first of all, that doesn't disprove originalism any more than it disproves any other theory of constitutional adjudication. There are always gonna be some precedents you don't like. Okay, so then what does a good and faithful judge do? And I think, so this is a common question we all face as judges. And I can't give you a, a glib answer on that. I worked with a dozen federal judges to write a 900 page book that mostly serves as a great doorstop for people on the question of precedent in the law. All right. Um, we are but next the, the, book club. <laughs> <laughs> right. That one's less interesting than the book we're talking about now. 
but the bottom line is, is it depends. And I think every good judge will tell you it depends. And we've kind of developed a list of factors that we think all, we kind of all more or less agree need to be considered. You know, how long has this been on the books? How many judges before us, because it does often reflect considered judgment by those who come before us. How many judges have thought about this and come to this conclusion? You know, and how deeply and richly have they examined it? Was it the product of an adversarial testing and a thorough vetting? Or is it a glib passing remark? Um, and then of course the reliance interests. Have people formed important reliance interests around this? I mean, sometimes the law is better settled than it is right. Who cares if we all drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road, so long as we all agree, okay? Um, and so a good judge tries to take into consideration a number of those kinds of factors. And, I, and, and so that's the best I can, the answer I can give you in a, in, a, in a short summary. If you want the longer answer, I'm afraid it's a lot more work. Well, you know, you are always a principled person. One thing I always know and think about with respect to you, and you're talking about these principled considerations developed with collaboration and thought. Um, everywhere in, the, in politics and in the media now, we see all kinds of assertions about judges and justices as political extensions of the presidents who appointed them. And your book is very critical of that idea that um, judges are just politicians in robes. Um, how do you convince the American people that judges aren't and shouldn't be just political extensions of Kelly, um, I lost you there, but I think I know what you, your question was. Uh, can you hear me now, all right? Yeah, I can, I'm okay. sorry for some reason I... Okay, so uh, that, that's why I wrote this book that we've been talking about. Um, during the, my confirmation process now about four years ago, uh, I was just really surprised, um, deeply surprised. And maybe that's because I've been you know, in my monastic hole as an appellate judge for so long, surrounded by great lawyers and judges um, and the Denver legal community, which is just a wonderful place to, to work. Uh, but I was deeply surprised by the um, number of people, good people, who, who, who took that view that, that, you know, you're just, you're just a politician in a robe and your job isn't much different than than those on Capitol Hill across the street here. Uh, and it's all just politics by extension. And you know, Ellie, if, if I believe that, I would have hung up my robe a long time ago. Um, it's just not, it's not as a, as a lawyer, what I saw out of judges and juries um, day in and day out when I was a trial lawyer in the trenches of the law. All I wanted was a fair shake for my client before as neutral a judge as a judge could try to be. And, and an honest set of 12 citizens from the community. Um, and that's what I've tried to be. And what I see uh, other federal judges across the country try to be day in and day out in cases big and small and most of which don't get any attention at all. And you know, it really does work. Our rule of law in this country is, is miraculous. Um, and I don't think we, I don't think we appreciate how lucky we are sometimes um, in it. It's the envy of much of the world, and it is, it is for good reason. Um, it isn't perfect, and I'm not here to tell you, you know, that that it is. And I'm not here to tell you that I don't disagree with my colleagues. Sometimes we do, but we disagree about questions of law, using sometimes different theories on how to approach law. But it's not politics by another name. And, and sometimes I try and one thing that helps me is to try and step back sometimes. And I, I talk about some facts and figures, and I hope you'll let me bore you for about another minute on them. But th this kind of sometimes gets the wheels spinning with, with some of the students I teach. Them. So in America, there are about 50 million lawsuits we file every year. 
in a country of 330 million people, that's a lot of lawsuits. And I'm putting aside your traffic tickets and your speeding tickets, okay? We're talking about real lawsuits here. And then in the federal system, out of those 50 million about that come in within the federal system, about 95% are resolved by the trial judge or a jury without further appeal. Now, I represented a lot of losing parties from time to time, and any lawyer who hasn't, hasn't been practicing very long. And what they'll usually tell you is something like, that's a crazy judge, and the jury got it all wrong. But I'm not gonna bother appealing because, they may not put it in exactly these words, but I got a chance to be heard. My story was told. I had my day in court. And so 95% of the time we accept the judgments of our courts as reasonably just at the trial level. Only 5% of cases go to the courts of appeals in this country. And I sat on the 10th circuit, which is an incredibly diverse court um, on any measure you wanna pick. It covers 20% of the landmass of the United States and two time zones. And I sat with colleagues appointed by President Obama back to President Lyndon Baines Johnson. And in those 5% of cases that came up, we managed to agree in panels of three, we'd sit in panels of three usually, unanimously 95% of the time. That's how determinate our law is even in the hard cases that do go on appeal. Well, then the kids always ask me, yeah, 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 of course, it's fine. But I've been studying all these five, four Supreme Court decisions, you know, and the, and the case books are chock full of them. And Ellie likes teaching the hard cases, not the easy ones. And I say, okay, fine, let's talk about those. But remember that that's not the forest. The forest of law in this country is what we just talked about. Only 70 cases wind up going to the United States Supreme Court every year. Now we look for cases where there's disagreement among the judges in the lower courts. Those are the cases we take, right? If every judge in America agrees on what the law means, there's no need for our intervention. Our intervention makes sense when there's disagreement. So the law can't mean one thing in Colorado and another thing in California. That's when we step in. So the lower court judges have disagreed. This is one of the small 5% cases in the courts of appeals where there's disagreement. And we usually wait till there's really endemic serious, thoughtful disagreements. So we make sure that we have the best thinking on both sides of the issue before we step in. 70 cases a year, that's it. Now I sit with nine judges, not three anymore. And I'll bet Ellie, when you try and get nine of your colleagues up to agree on where to go to lunch, you have some difficulty. Given the 70 hardest cases every year where your colleagues in the lower courts have disagreed, imagine that, right? Yet we managed to come to a unanimous judgment about 40% of the time in cases where our colleagues below have disagreed. So, you know, that's the tree of the Supreme Court. And then, and then the kids say, yeah, yeah, but what about those five, four decisions? We haven't talked about those yet. And I say, okay, fine, you know, all right. Now we're down to the pine cone maybe, okay. That makes up about 25% of our docket maybe 33% in the year. And last year, I don't know the number, but the year before I do know the number, there were 10 different combinations of justices in those five to four decisions. You don't hear about that every day, do you? And then let's step back one layer further and then I'll stop. Those figures, the 40% figure about unanimous judgments and the five, four decisions about 25 to 33% a year, have been constant since about 1945. There's nothing new, nothing new. And back then, the Supreme Court, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had appointed eight of the nine justices of the United States Supreme Court. Today, I think there are five different presidents appointed us and we're doing just as well as they did back then. That's the rule of law in this country. That's the true story of the rule of law in this country. And I think it's something we should all be very grateful for and proud of. Um, you talk about what a collegial and collaborative environment the Supreme Court is. Um, since the time that you arrived, Justice Kennedy retired. 
and Justice Ginsburg passed away. And I wonder if you could share what you miss most about having these colleagues on the court. Oh. That's tough, Ellie. That's tough. Well, we just buried Ruth uh, not long ago. Um, we had a personal jurisdiction case a few weeks back. And if anybody understands the development of personal jurisdiction doctrine since international shoe, it was my colleague Ruth Ginsburg. And her voice at conference, I, I just I was just sitting through all conference thinking, I wish Ruth were here to tell me what to do. <laughs> And, and I know that afterwards we'd all go to lunch and, and she would sneak a couple of the cookies off the tray and maybe a muffin and that would be her entire lunch. Um, I don't know, she had such a sweet tooth. I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how she stayed so thin. Uh, Justice Kennedy, um, he's easier to miss. He's right down the hall and he likes to come into my office about every other week and, and watch me reading a brief and, and just laugh at me. Ha, 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 I don't miss that. You know, what are you reading about now? The Internal Revenue Code, ERISA? Um, uh, he is a, a gentle man, even in his ribbing. It's amazing that you were able to serve with the justice that you clerked for. And I that's historically the first time that's happened. Um, you're the only justice from the Western United States. You studied history and philosophy in addition to law. You were a litigator, a government lawyer, an appellate court judge. How have your own experiences shaped the way that you look at legal issues? Well, I mean, we're all products of our own environment. Uh, and Arizona is blessed with one of the great Western, two of the great Western jurists of this court. Um, uh, and, you know, one of my great heroes is Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about things that, that she loved and cared about, civics, civility, access to justice. I mean, these were all things that she talked about, worked on her whole professional life. And from one Western to another, I just said, thank you. And uh, we're trying to find our best to carry on uh, some of those traditions. But, you know, uh, how, how does an individual justice's experiences uh, affect his or her jurisprudence? I leave that to, I leave that to the professors to explore, Ellie. You, you, you can you can make surmise that, that, that you may that that's the whole there's a whole industry in that I, I wouldn't want to purport to get in the way yeah well uh, in tort law I'm focus, mostly focus on the state so I'll leave that to a few other professors to look at but let me just say that Justice O'Connor also um, taught a number of courses at the University of Arizona in the time that I've been here. And um, I want to add to um, you know the list of uh, dignitaries who would love to have you come, whether to um, just to speak, to visit, to teach a class, um, to come to Tucson and to join us so we can have a longer conversation. I have about a hundred questions that I still wanna ask you and um, that uh, some of our students and, and faculty um, wanted to ask you. And so I'll just invite you to continue this conversation as your schedule allows and come join us here in Arizona. Well, I look forward to the opportunity when the world allows us all to get together, Ellie, I really do. It won't be too soon. And you know, you don't have to sell me on Arizona. I mean, that backdrop again just reminds me of the flat irons of Boulder and home. That speaks home to me. 
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend a little time together this way. Really enjoyed it, Ellie. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I just appreciate your time and um, to be continued. To be continued.